I'm Lenny Kravitz, and this is my pop culture artifacts collection. We are in Paris, France. I go from living here uh, to living in an Airstream trailer in the Bahamas. It's quite a contrast. I've always thrived on contrasts. I collect a lot of things from the family, things that remind me of my childhood, things that remind me of growing up in New York City. And I collect uh, pop culture artifacts, mainly in the field of music. The pieces came to me one by one. It, it kind of just worked out, too. I, I never planned any of this. I never planned to have a Muhammad Ali, James Brown room. I got the dudes from his last fight. You know, I would have gotten them just for that. But the fact that that fight was then in the Bahamas, where my family's from, it just made an interesting connection. They actually have some of his blood on them. Uh, his DNA is on, the, is on the shoes. I'm not really a sports. Uh, collector, but uh, this is about uh, a great human being. I have a poem that was written from Muhammad Ali to James Brown. On the back we have the address written by Muhammad Ali to James Brown. What he did was he used King James Brown as the words here that he wanted to start with, and it talks about you know what he thinks about uh, James Brown and his appreciation for him. And then we have a picture here of James Brown, a portrait taken by Diane Arbus. And by the way, these tusks are not real. They are faux. They are made of wood. They're by Pucci uh, in the 60s. These are a pair of boots that were worn and belonged to James Brown. These were in his repertoire. He had quite a collection. I have many, many pair all over the house. There's just something magical about James Brown's shoes to me. It's almost as though they have superpowers. If you were to put these on, you would be able to dance like James Brown. These are magic <laughs> boots. So I got all of these things. I got his shoes, I got handwritten lyrics and music. You see his font there, James Brown Productions, and you see a little picture of James. As a kid, that composition was one of my favorites. I had the 45. It's just uh, one of those tracks. This is a mantle where I keep things that are special to me. First, we have a pair of Prince's shoes, uh, personally worn, his personal tambourine, and one of his guitars. My hands uh, that were done by my Uncle Dave. He made these molds, and we put uh, plaster around my hands and made these. I have the watch of somebody very special to me and very special to my family. His name is Bobby Short. He called himself a saloon singer. He sang uh, Rogers and Hart, uh, Gershwin, Cole Porter, and was a great interpreter uh, of that music. I have the set list from Woodstock that Jimi Hendrix wrote right before he went on. Songs for Woodstock has the list of songs. What's amazing about that to me is that Woodstock wasn't Woodstock until it was finished. The legend was after the fact. This is the jumpsuit worn by James Brown, 1974, Zaire, Africa. Rumble in the Jungle, that was the extremely famous fight where Ali regained his title. And James Brown headlined a concert before the fight. GFOS, Godfather of Soul, baby. Well, Jimi Hendrix is, I mean, he's beyond the greatest rock and roll guitar player. So these articles that, that, that I have, you know, came over time, starting with the purple velvet pants, later into the vest and the shirt, I found out that he wore them all at one time. So that is another piece of that magic that happens. And I later acquired the Crosstown Traffic lyrics and the set list to Woodstock. His aura, his vibe, his music, his electricity changed my life, it educated me. It turned me on, you know? John Lennon was another individual that, you know, lived his life being an artist who had no boundaries. This is a shirt that belonged to John Lennon. It was given to me by Yoko Ono on my birthday. I was over at the Dakotas and Yoko realized that it was my birthday and she pulled me into the room 
and started going through these drawers. I didn't know what she was doing. She pulled out this shirt and she said, this belonged to John, it was one of his favorites. He loved this shirt. Here, happy birthday. Beautiful gesture. This to me is the holy grail. These are the lyrics of Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band when Paul wrote it with all the corrections, uh, lyrics that didn't make it. This song and this album changed everything in rock and roll. It was such a psychedelic statement and something that made everybody think about how they were gonna improve their game and go further. And you hear so many people citing Sgt. Pepper as the day that you know changed everything you know, for them. This is a jacket that was worn by Miles Davis. It was given to me by his wife, my godmother, Cicely Tyson. After he died, she called me over and presented it to me saying that Miles would have wanted me to have it. Miles Davis is a personal one for me because I started to go see him play live when I was a teenager. And I was just blown away. And then I got to know him as, uh, as, a, as an adult. You know, the last time I saw him, I can remember we were on an airplane together. Let Love Rule had been out. I had just finished doing the tour, and he told me how proud he was of me, and, and that was just everything for me, to hear those words out of his mouth. Aha, this is my very first concert. It was the Jackson 5, Madison Square Garden. My father took me to this concert. I remember coming home from school, getting home, having dinner, and then him saying he was taking me somewhere. I didn't know where he was taking me. We got to the Madison Square Garden. I still didn't know, I didn't see the sign, I couldn't see what was going on. The lights went out and the Jackson 5 came on and I lost my mind. That was the turning point. The next morning I knew exactly what I wanted to do. This is so special to me because of what it is. And my father took this and it was the moment that changed my life. My father was a very interesting and complex man. He was a lover of, of music and the arts. And, you know, I have articles of, of both of my parents. I have my father's shoes upstairs that he wore to work. I have his glasses. I have his stopwatch from NBC. I have his wristwatch. It's just beautiful to keep the spirit of my folks with me. I don't have them physically, but I, I have the memories. I have the energy that they left. This is the first television that my parents had in our apartment in New York City. I don't know how this got saved throughout the years. It's by Singer who made sewing machines. We all used to sit around this thing, three of us, and watch TV. There's the speaker, and there was the channel changer with the little numbers on it. This is, this is my first memory of television and of uh, all the shows uh, I watched as a kid. Tying back to Muhammad Ali, my parents went to the Ali Frazier fight, the first one, Madison Square Garden, which was, you know, the fight of the, of the world. Uh, I couldn't go, I was too young. But they brought me back those gloves, which were part of the uh, merchandise. Those were in my room as a child, my entire life. I then put the gloves away wherever they ended up. I found them years later, I pulled them out, and I had one glove sent to each fighter, and they both signed one of the gloves and sent them back to me. So they're a childhood memory. I used to play with them. They're a historical uh, memory from these, from two of the greatest fighters of all time. Do you think about where this collection will go? Will you give it to Zoe? Will it move on to the... Of course, every, everything is always. It's, it's family stuff, you know, from James Brown to Bob Marley to John Lennon to the Beatles to Jimi Hendrix to Muhammad Ali to the television, the marbles, the, my hands cast by my uncle. These are all things that made me, that influenced me.